The dark forest is a very common mythic archetype and trope, and it has appeared in all kinds of stories for the, literally the last two and a half to three thousand years in the Western world, and even longer in other places such as uh, India and Southeast Asia. Let's unpack what the basic archetype of the dark forest. First, it generally means the unknown or the unconscious. In many stories, it kind of represents the darker inner world of shadowy mysteries where there's things stalking you through the branches, whether it's small dangers like venomous snakes or mythical magical beasts like centaurs, that sort of thing. It is also a place of the unfamiliar or the untamed wild. So when you venture out into the dark forest, this is where you go when you are confronting new challenges. This is one of the ways that it is often used in those kinds of stories. Another aspect of the dark forest is that it represents the mysterious feminine, usually, or otherwise mysterious uh, spiritual. And so we see this, uh, for instance, in the Artemis and Diana Greek and Roman myths. There's also a very powerful trend of the dark forest being a place of test and transformation. So heroes often will go through the dark forest or go to the dark forest to claim a sword or attack the tower or whatever. And so this is because you're going into a wild, untamed, dangerous region. And when you when you anchor yourself in the context of ancient peoples, whether, you know, Greeks, Romans or any period before the modern era, basically you had your safe village and then you had the surrounding wild, untamed land and that might have been desert, it might have been bogs, it might have been ocean, um, but in many cases it was dark forests. And so the dark forest basically enshrouds uh, civilization. And so with that, let's pivot to the history of the Western origins of the dark forest trope. Because what I do want to point out is that the Western world, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, so the Northwest, um, that includes America and Europe, uh, basically us white people, we have one take of the dark forest trope, but the global south and the global east, there's actually some common uh, patterns that emerge, but they tended to live more embedded in the forest rather than apart from it. Their, their relationship to the dark forest is a little bit different from ours. So for the ancient Greeks and Romans, which kind of are the foundation of much of Western civilization, the dark forest represented the edge of civilization. And so what I mean by the edge of civilization is that you had the city-state. You had Athens and Greece and Rome, but then the forest was the boundary between the area that was civilized and groomed and contained to the realm where uh, nature and the gods and even exotic dangerous people resided. And so, for instance, you have the Gauls, which you know Rome was constantly uh, at war with until Gauls were conquered, and then you had the Germanic tribes, which uh, the Romans were never able to fully conquer, but then you had uh, the Mongolians, the Berbers, the Carthaginians all coming at them through the forest. And so the dark forest became this kind of place of not just untamed wildness, but a place of active hostility, which I'll talk about how that has manifested in a few stories in just a moment. But they were untamed. They were magical. Most importantly to the Greeks and Romans, the wilds, the dark forest were chaotic. This was the opposite of logic and order, which they loved because they saw that cities and stability and civilization were not given, that this is something that humans had to build and protect. And so they saw it as they were this civilizing force and Mother Nature was much larger than them, um, but also mar far more powerful. And so this is why many of the gods reside in the forest, because this is beyond the scope of human control. This is beyond the domain of human control. Now, with that being said, many Greeks and Romans were responsible for deforestation and other things, and so they were reshaping the natural uh, landscape around themselves. But even so, uh, when you when you consider the scope of the forests that surrounded them, like in Macedonia, what we now call modern-day France and Germany, it was a big place, and it was very dark and forbidding. And also, their enemies lived there. Beyond that, stories of bandits and dangerous wildlife. So there are actively, um, you know, whether it was the outcasts of society. So this is a very common trope. Um, so for instance, if you were banished from Athens, like exile was considered like worse than being put to death in some respects, because you were cast out of civilization. 
And so the bandits, the smugglers, the rebels, they would all go live in the forest with the, you know, the wild people and so on and so forth. But then there's also, that's where the wolves live. That's where, once you get to Asia, that's where the tigers and elephants live. That's where the venomous snakes live. And so these mythical predators in the minds of these ancient peoples were then blown up to be mythical monsters like centaurs, but also capricious gods, because you're flipping a coin as to whether or not you're going to come back alive. And so this gets blown up into trolls and ogres and that sort of thing. And so trolls uh, are really popular in the Scandinavian cosmogonic cycles and myths because of just how densely forested they are and mountains. And so basically the troll represents the, the, the forbidding danger of nature, particularly forested mountains, because you go out and you might never come back. You fall into a cave, you fall into a crevasse, whatever. And so the troll is a personification of how dangerous forested mountains can be. As an example, that's not necessarily the only thing that they represent, but in the context of forests, uh, that is some that is one of the things that giants, ogres, and trolls can represent. Now, there's been a few kind of popular uh, examples in mainstream media, pop culture examples. The master of archetypes in literature is obviously J.R.R. Tolkien, so in Lord of the Rings, there are two forests that kind of represent all of these tropes all in one. That is Mirkwood and Fangorn. So Mirkwood was the forest that Bilbo had to travel through in The Hobbit. And Mirkwood, as you might remember, famously had the giant spiders and it was poisoned by, you know, forces of evil. This is a throwback to the way that Westerners viewed forests, that forests were dark. They were places of uh, danger of just random things that could kill you, whether it was vapors and mists that were poisonous, gigantic spiders, the necromancer's hideout, the, you know, the, the lair was deep in the forest. That represents the, the necromancer's tower deep in the forest of Mirkwood represents like the darkest part of a self. The reason that archetypes are so powerful is that they can be interpreted many different ways. So one way to interpret the necromancer's tower in Mirkwood, that is the, like the nucleus, the core of evil that resides within everyone. And so then you need some uh, mythical force for good, such as Gandalf, to go into the tower, to purge it, to clean it. And this is uh, tantamount to cleansing your soul. In the movies, uh, Gimli actually kind of says it out loud when they're going through Fangorn. It is a, he said like this hideous, dark, dank, dangerous forest. And then of course all the trees start groaning at him. But it's really funny for Gimli to criticize some somewhere for being dark, dank, and dangerous because he lives in a cave, which is both dark and dank and also very dangerous. That is kind of like a projection of Western views of forests, um, which is like kind of intrinsically sees forests as dangerous, as places of wild magic. And then, of course, in, in Fangorn, the trees themselves will attack you. You don't even need animals. The trees are, themselves are dangerous, which is kind of funny. And then you see this again more recently in Harry Potter with the Forbidden Forest. So the Forbidden Forest is a direct copy of these archetypes, of Mirkwood and Fangorn, and of course, going further back to the Gauls and, and Germanic uh, regions of Rome. And so in the Forbidden Forest, you have giants and trolls and centaurs, and it, it is a place of active hostility. It is actively unsafe for quote-unquote civilized white people to go there because the darker-skinned, more muscular, more magic-wielding uh, people and creatures live there, and they actively want to kill you. This is a direct trope from the age of exploration, which we'll go into in just a moment. But before I dive into that, I just want to wrap up that, you know, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, both by British authors, which is completely unsurprising when you consider the British Empire and the legacy of all the stories that British explorers and British historians brought back. So this is a long-term trend that you also have to remember that the British in particular valorized the classics and studying the antiquities. When you had the age of exploration and you had British explorers going all over the world, hacking their way through, you know, jungles and forests and rainforests and bringing back these stories, this was a population that was also highly educated on the Greek and Roman myths. And so they saw this parody, they saw this parallel between the way that the Greeks and Romans were oriented towards the forest as dark, dangerous scary places where things wanted to kill you. And then they went to places like India, the Amazon, and Africa, where again, the local people were out to kill you, or the local animals were out to kill you, or even the environment itself seemed to want to kill you. So whenever you see references to 
like poisonous mists and vapors. You have to remember that that was how people believed that plagues and diseases like malaria spread because they didn't realize that it was carried on, you know, fleas, ticks, mosquitoes, that sort of thing. The best model that they had for plague was you go to this place, you get exposed to these mists, you get sick and die. You go to this other place, you get exposed to these odd vapors, you get sick and die. And so mists and vapors are a allegory or kind of what we believed were the carrier of these exotic tropical diseases that tended to kill white Western explorers. And so you go to India and of course the locals, like this is a very Western perception because the locals lived there just fine. They knew which places to avoid, which places were safe. There are all kinds of local uh, pearls of wisdom, like don't live in that valley, you'll go, you'll die because that's where the diseases are. And of course to the locals, they're like, well, yeah, you go into that valley, you die because you get sick. So we stay up on the mountains or we stay in this other valley. Um, but to, to Western explorers, it seems somewhat arbitrary because in you know the highlands of Scotland, valleys are more or less the same. You're not going to get malaria in one valley and be fine in another valley. Uh, likewise, the bogs of, uh, that are all over England are a known quantity, um, but you're not going to be stalked by tigers and elephants um, in the bogs of England. And so when you look at these other places, the, the threat profile, the risk profile, kind of taking a more objective uh, term, is just super unfamiliar. And so that lack of familiarity is why this trope of dark, mysterious, you know, the, the forest is just unknown and it's wild and untamed. Um, but then you also have the, the, the quote unquote savages, and I'm making sure to put that in air quotes because, again, that is a very, uh, particularly a Western a European explorer uh, perception or characterization of the local people. And so then you say, oh, well, look at these people wearing nothing but loincloths and they kill each other with, you know, clubs or whatever. And so then this led to the view that we are civilized and they are not. And again, there was an echo. This was a mirror of what the Greeks and Romans had recorded. And so there was this uh, rich cultural heritage that the Westerners had from reading the classics and said, ah, it's the same pattern, and it, and it has been the same for thousands of years. And so then, the uh, particularly the the British Empire, for econ primarily economic reasons, created the civilizing mission. Um, the before the British Empire, there was the French and Spanish uh, empires, and the Spanish also had a civilizing mission, but it was primarily a religious one. And the Spanish were the the Spanish Catholics were kind of confused as to why the locals kept killing them when they tried to you know, bring them Jesus. Um, but then what happened was as the British became better at expanding, they focused more on the economics, the pragmatic saying like, Hey, we're going to bring you new weapons, new foods, new, new metals, and you're going to give us your exotic spices and silks. And we're going to trade. This was basically the forming of the British empire. Um, now, of course they learned that from the Dutch, the Dutch started the trend, um, but they, the Dutch were not as, they were not as good at systemizing it as the British were. So the age of exploration ranging from the 15th to 19th century ish, a period of about 400 years um, as uh, white Westerners were expanding around the world. And they, they came in contact with all these, all these people, all these seemingly magical shamanic things, but they viewed it with very distinctly through the lens of we are civilized. They are not, they are using dark magics and this is these are wild, untamed areas that we have a responsibility to civilize. And then also, uh, maybe not a responsibility, but they had the opportunity to extract and exploit it. And then one of the final, I, I don't want to say final, but one of the big um, things of the 20th century was Teddy Roosevelt's expedition to the Amazon, which I think happened in 1914. Anyways, the Amazon at the time was largely unmapped, and so that he wanted to go find the headwaters of, I think it was the Amazon River. It might have been another river. Um, and so they chartered some locals and went upstream. Teddy Roosevelt nearly died. He was sick with fever or malaria most of the trip. Um, and the only reason that he kept himself going was because he knew that if he died, his son would work really hard to like try and get him back, and then his son would die too. So like he kept himself together just so that his like his son would make it out alive, basically. But they brought back stories of being stalked by locals that they never saw. Now, Teddy was also given to hyperbole, so it remains to be seen as to whether or not the local the locals were really the, you know, the shadowy savages that he made them out to be. But still the point remains is that this story 
parallels very closely all of the other stories from the Age of Exploration and from the classics of the uh, ancient Greek and Roman period. And so this is why we have this very consistent Western mythology around the Dark Forest, because it is a place that, that actively wants to kill you. Again, not just the people, whether or not there's people, even the, the ground itself wants to kill you, the bugs, the predators, the air itself seems hostile, which this is why in Mirkwood, when Bilbo was going through the forest, they, they talked about how it was choking. Um, it felt claustrophobic, like you couldn't breathe in the forest. And this was this was a throwback to the the quote unquote the mists and vapors that would you know make you sick and die. And this is depicted in the movie as well, where they're kind of like disoriented and kind of like feverishly wandering through Mirkwood. That's probably an echo of what it's like to be like feverish with malaria as you're staggering through the forest. Real history, but then it becomes this mythic archetype in the brains of people. So then that, of course, is all a very Western-centric view of the Dark Forest. So what about the Global East? What about the Global South? Two people that are indigenous to the forests or the jungles or the rainforests, most of them see the forest as full of guardian spirits of some kind. Now, some of the, some of the spirits are more hostile, but many of them are guardian spirits. So they might be in the form of shades or ghosts or you know tree spirits but the thing is is they have a very different relationship because they live embedded in the forest so they kind of see themselves as part of it and so this is where you see tropes like where you have to maintain a balance with the forest or you have to become part of it this was kind of made into a trope in james cameron's avatar where it's like oh you have to be one with the forest and that of course is is what's called the noble savage trope which we'll get into in just a second the rainforest and jungle is also a source of medicine and so this is why they had the the view that it was kind of um, a source of guardian spirits as well as hostility. Because, you know, if you live in India, you might get killed by a viper, but the forest is also going to be your source of food, your source of medicine, and also a source of protection from outsiders. Because again, the forests were dangerous to traverse. The rivers were dangerous to traverse. There might be alligators or crocodiles um, or, you know, fish with giant teeth or whatever, all kinds of things that can eat you. There are catfish that are large enough to eat children, um, like the Mekong, um, I think they're in, where are they, China, Southeast Asia? It's all dangerous. And of course, the, the rivers are very eutrophic. So a eutrophic river is one that is cloudy. They're all brown because there's lots of organic uh, particles suspended. So you can't even see them. Um, but they, you know, they can see you or they can hear you and feel you. But because the forest was the source of food and medicine and protection, they had this very um, nuanced view, a relationship with the forest that basically said like, hey, we are part of this ecosystem, but we are not in control of it. And again, you see this kind of made into a trope or a caricature in a lot of uh, Western media. Uh, shamans, so the medicine men of the tribes in places like India, Africa, Southeast Asia, they were the ones who were tasked with knowing the forest, you know, reading the signs of the forest and understanding um, what plants did what and, and so on and so forth. Um, but they would often, you know, go out and quote unquote commune with the forest. Um, and many tribes in the Amazon still do this today where the shamans are the ones who make the ayahuasca. And so if you're not familiar, ayahuasca is one of the most powerful psychedelics on the planet. And it is a brew that is a mixture of a vine and another and a leaf of another plant. It's not something that occurs naturally. You have to make it. But then the way that the shamans do it is they go out into the forest and they practice making it and practice doing the ayahuasca to commune with nature. And of course, that communing with nature has become a trope that has been adopted by Western uh, peoples. But again, in all of these cases, the forest or the jungle is full of predators, whether it's gigantic predators like uh, tigers that can weigh up to 400 pounds, elephants that can weigh, I think, up to 12,000 pounds. Um, and of course, elephants are not predators of humans, but they will absolutely kill humans if you're not careful. There's spiders, there's snakes, there's tigers, elephants, all kinds of things out there. And so in the in the global east and global south, usually the forest is seen as something that is a large presence, but it's also something that they have to have a relationship with, a two-way relationship with, rather than something that is there to be conquered and exploited, which of course is why um, you know we see extensive logging in places like Amazon now, primarily due to economics, because there is something of value there that needs to be extracted and exploited. Uh, it doesn't need to be, but that some people want to extract and exploit, I think is a better way of putting it. And then similar to, for instance, Scandinavia with the forested mountains being the source of like trolls and ogres, Japan is a really interesting example because the mountains of Japan are incredibly steep and incredibly accessible. 
they're prone to landslides and they're heavily forested, which means they're almost impassable unless you are a specialized like mountain climber. Uh, because of this, the valleys of Japan are somewhat isolated. And during the periods of like the shogunate, so this was what you might call the feudal period of Japan, each valley was kind of its own little kingdom uh, protected on all sides by the, by the mountains, by the valleys that they lived in. And so you have some very similar archetypes emerging in Japan, such as the Kodama, uh, Kami, and other things, basically saying like, this is a place of uh, mysterious magical forces, it's all ancient, um, and it all resides in the mountains and the forests. Uh, this is why the ninja live up there and that sort of thing. And so finally, what I wanted to do as we wound down the video is just talk about a couple of the modern Western uh, examples of these archetypes. So I already mentioned Avatar by James Cameron. This movie is good in that it basically shines a light. It's basically Ferngully, but for adults. Um, if you're not familiar, Ferngully was a movie with Robin Williams and a few other famous actors and, and musicians um, that basically said, like, rainforests are good. You should protect them. I grew up watching Ferngully, so, like, I grew up with, like, yes, rainforests are good, and they're, they're, they might be mysterious, but they're generally a positive thing. And so then in Avatar, in James Cameron's Avatar, the idea is that it's the noble savage trope where it's like you have the the, the civilizing, extractive, exploitative Western uh, power, and then you go integrate with the locals and you learn that the forest, the rainforest is actually not that dangerous. It is a source of life and healing and medicine. And it's not by accident that the main character, Jake, is paralyzed, like he's physically injured. He's, he's physically disabled when he gets there. And then by transitioning into this magical world, he is physically rehabilitated and emotionally rehabilitated by becoming one with the forest. That is a trope. That is naked cultural appropriation. But the lesson for us white people, us Westerners, is, hey, maybe the forest and the jungle is actually not something that is dark and dangerous and hideous and dank and whatever. Maybe it is actually a place of spiritual and physical healing. One problem with this, though, is that uh, particularly movies like Avatar romanticize a simpler way of life and romanticize the people there. While it is true that there is a lot of wisdom to be gleaned from tribal peoples, from local peoples, uh, cultural appropriation is generally a bad thing. Um, if you look at some of the information coming out of places like Central and South America, uh, the current wave of popularity of psychedelic medicine and psychedelic healing and shamanic healing is by and large kind of being reacted to with mixed messages because in some respects um, indigenous people say hey we kept this this tradition of shamanic healing of psychedelic healing alive because we knew that it was valuable but in other cases it's considered sacred and not for outsiders and so then again um, you get this kind of like level of exploitation but the idea of someone, quote unquote, going native, which they actually said in Avatar, has actually happened many, many times. Like that is a trope for a reason. Going back to the original settlers in America, more often than not, if a English style or, or European style village or settlement failed, the survivors would integrate with the local cultures. And they saw this through, through genetics because after a while they started seeing local um, like indigenous peoples, Native Americans, with gray eyes, which they did not genetically have gray eyes. They got that from genetic admixture from English people uh, or Europeans in general, bringing some of those genes and then integrating with the local population. This has happened all throughout North, Central, and South America, basically from the time of discovery up through the modern day, where there are stories of people saying, you know what, I'm kind of done with Western civilization. I'm going to uh, integrate with a local tribe. Um, and in some cases, those people that integrate with a local tribe will uh, kind of change their mind. And what I mean by that is that, like, they might try and come back to, you know, Western civilization, but then they, they'll, they usually end up going back. And they prefer going back for a number of reasons. But again, this is, while this does happen, it's not incredibly common. And it also serves to reinforce the narrative of romanticizing uh, local local cultures. It's not for everyone. And also, I don't mean to pathologize local cultures. The pathologizing comes from commentators, uh, particularly educated white Western people who just cannot un understand why someone would leave civilization. Um, then, of course, plenty of comedians have talked about this. It's like, ah, oh, well, you know, you've got 
uh, sexism and patriarchy and all sorts of other, you know, problems. You've got taxes. And it's like, yeah, sometimes you just want to throw off all the shackles of and trappings of civilization and go live in the forest as a witch, right? Like, there's a reason for that trope. Another uh, modern trope, one of the ones that I grew up with was Jumanji, which in hindsight, Jumanji was even more problematic um, because it basically turned uh, all of those kind of ar mythic archetypes up to 11. There's dangerous plants and animals, the you know gigantic tennis ball sized mosquitoes that want to eat you. And then they even had, um, I can't remember his name, but the British hunter, right? Like <laughs> that was such a, such a like on the nose trope of like the, the, like the British explorer who's there to just like wreck havoc and kill everything. Um, and so this trope is called green hell. So the green hell trope is basically like you go somewhere that you don't belong as a white person and literally everything there wants to kill you. And then another one was a thriller movie, um, called Anaconda, which is basically like a trip to, uh, South America, a bunch of white people didn't belong there. The the stoic locals kind of like, you know, that worshipped the local snake gods kind of, you know, disappeared into the forest. And then the local snake gods came to eat the white people, which reading it that way is actually kind of funny. But again, that that is where that is another example of the dark forest. Just literally everything there wants to kill you or eat you. Let me know what you thought. I've been wanting to make this video for a while. It's a new format, so I'm getting used to it. Uh, so let me know in the comments what you think. But yeah, thanks for watching. Cheers. Have a good one.